Hi, I'm John Stern. I'm going to be talking about one of the most challenging and frustrating and important areas in epilepsy treatment, and that is how to combine medications. As Dr. Wexler commented, we live in an era when we have many medications to treat epilepsy, and any future medications will have to prove themselves to be superior or have benefits beyond what we already have. As such, combining medications has become more important, and the term rational polypharmacy has become a lingering catchphrase for using the medications intelligently, meaning how can we combine medications to optimally control seizures. The medications we have are very rarely me too drugs. The medications have a variety of mechanisms of action, and there are very little overlap between them. This slide shows those mechanisms, and one can see that even when the medications include a combination of maybe a sodium channel effect and a calcium channel effect, the type of effect on the calcium channel can vary. As such, we shouldn't expect the medications to have the same effect as individuals, and the challenge before us is how to combine them in a way that maximizes the seizure control or minimizes the side effects at the same time. Historically, polytherapy was the norm, and there was a shift in the concept of treating epilepsy in the 1970s leading into the 1980s, mostly because of several pivotal articles that came out of England. In fact, in the early years of treating epilepsy, after more than one medication was available, patients were routinely treated with a combination of medications, and pills were manufactured that included a combination of drugs. It was observed in the 1970s that initial monotherapy had a similar efficacy, or a similar benefit for seizure control, that is, as initial polytherapy, and this was a, a novel observation. It was also observed that the seizure control tended to depend upon having at least one medication at a dose or at the serum or blood level that was expected to be efficacious or producing seizure control, and that adding a second drug didn't necessarily increase the overall seizure control. These observations led to a reconsideration of the need for polytherapy and shifted the concept of treatment from polytherapy toward monotherapy. And in fact, it was then observed that taking individuals who are on combination of drugs and switching them to monotherapy or treatment with one drug could lead to a decrease in seizures and could lead to a decrease in adverse effects. And so we've lived with the concept that monotherapy has superiority for quite a while now. And what's missing from these studies is the idea that not all polytherapy is the same. What's also missing is the current recognition that when treating epilepsy, there's a substantial patient population who respond to the first drug used, which would be monotherapy, and another population who tend not to respond to any combination of drugs and continue having seizures. This population, the individuals with medication-resistant seizures, would not expect to have an improvement in seizure control when adding a second drug to the first because of seizure control already being a problem. As such, these studies that were done decades ago were not including the observation that it's really a question of which polytherapies are best and that for initial treatment, monotherapy may be superior. However, for medication-resistant seizures, there may be advantages to polytherapy. More recently, the value of polytherapy has been reconsidered with more sophisticated studies than were available in the 1970s and 80s. And this has followed the recognition that with the increasing number of medications available, more patients are on polytherapy. In fact, it's now estimated that about one-third of people with epilepsy are on a combination of anti-seizure medications. The more sophisticated studies have looked at the comparison of polytherapy versus monotherapy, or have looked at the polytherapy amount of medication taken, and have has done this by normalizing the doses. What this means is that if we assume that a typical dose for phenytoin is 300 milligrams, that becomes a dose of one, and if we assume that the typical dose for carbamazepine is 800 milligrams, that becomes a dose of one. With this, one can add up the amount of medication a person is taking, irrespective of which medications are being used. And what's been found is that the likelihood of adverse effects or side effects is not so much related to the number of medications taken, but is much more refer referable to the total amount of medication taken. A comparative trial of monotherapy with carbamazepine to a combination of carbamazepine with sodium valparate found that the efficacy was similar be between these two arms and that the likelihood 
of adverse effects was dependent upon the total amount of medication, not the question of whether a person was on one drug or a combination of two drugs. This supports the idea that polytherapy is not inferior to monotherapy in terms of adverse effects, which was the observation decades earlier. However, we know that some patients do respond better to polytherapy. And finding that polytherapy regimen for that patient is truly the challenge. We can't go through a successive trial with each individual patient of one medication after another and then one combination of medications after another because the number of possible combinations is just too large a number for one individual to go through. And the time period of testing each combination can be weeks or months or sometimes longer depending upon the seizure frequency. The mechanisms of action, of course, are different across the medications. But these mechanisms don't necessarily tell us how the medications line up or how they can be best used together. There's a concept of rational polypharmacy that's based upon using complementary mechanisms, choosing one drug with one mechanism, combining with another drug of a different mechanism, with the idea that by using complementary mechanisms of action, one gets better efficacy. However, ultimately it depends on how well it works. And we know that these mechanisms that have been identified are not necessarily the only mechanisms that each of these drugs has. And there might be mechanisms that we don't know about. And so it really becomes more of an individual drug matter. Ultimately, what we need for rational polypharmacy is data, data that will steer the choice of combinations for the individuals for whom monotherapy is not effective. One way to generate data for polypharmacy is with basic research using animal models of epilepsy. And these studies have been done producing what's called an isobologram. This slide you see before you is the result of comparison of levetiracetam to leucosamide in combination therapy. The key part of the slide to first look at is what's in black and labeled as ED50, which is the efficacious dose 50 for 50% 50 of the animals in the study. One can determine what that dose is for each individual drug. If two drugs in combination are have similar effect when combined as when it used individually, one expect a line that at half of the ED50 for levetiracetam combined with half of the ED50 for leucosamide, one sh which sh should get efficacy or seizure response right on the line that connects them. If one finds that the efficacy improves as you combine them, that's a sign of a synergistic interaction or that the combination of the two medications doesn't add up in a linear way where one plus one equals two, but lines up in a way that one plus one equals more than two. This evidence from this animal model suggests a synergy or a benefit for seizure control, at least in the animal model, between levetiracetam and leucosamide. Isobolographic experiments have been done with numerous medications, as this slide shows, and there's evidence of some favorable interaction with some combinations and especially favorable interactions with others. You can see that these are many different medication combinations, although they still are a small minority of the possible combinations that exist. This can be useful for going forward toward studies in humans for real seizure response because our goal is, of course, controlling seizures in people. Human studies have looked at combinations in different ways. And this paper from 10 years ago looked at almost 3,000 consecutive patients at one center. Each patient was treated according to that patient's clinical situation. And then an analysis was done looking at the combinations of medications that were present in the population. Just over half of the individuals in the study were seizure-free for the prior year. And this is about what one would expect in a consecutive patient population of people who were newly diagnosed. Of the people who were seizure-free, 79% were on one medication, and 287 of that 1,600 individuals who were, on, who were seizure free were on two medications. So the question is, of those 287 people, which regimens were more commonly present in the patient population who were seizure free? And what stood out was that the individuals on a combination of lamotrigine and valparate were more likely to be in that group of people who were on two drugs and seizure free. Of course, this study has limitations in that it's steered based upon the clinicians at the center's belief about which medications might work well, and there might be selection towards certain patients being on certain combinations and others. But it's still valuable, at least at this one center, as a signal or a clue as to which combinations might be helpful. One can see that other combinations were present as well, 
and then there are many combinations that were very rarely producing seizure freedom at this one center. Another way to look at combinations is to use the randomized control data that comes out of the studies performed in order for a drug to become legal or approved by the FDA in the United States. And this is an analysis of the phase three or the large clinical studies that were performed for the approval of leucosamide. Leucosamide, as Dr. Wexler described, has an effect on the sodium channel, and it's an effect that's different than the effect of the more traditional anti-seizure medications that Dr. Gadal described. The effect is one that doesn't overlap completely with the older seizure medications such as phenytoin and carbamazepine. And the question is whether the individuals who were in, this clinical, in these clinical studies had differences in seizure control if they were on a combination of the new drug, glucosamide, with one of the traditional sodium channel drugs, or if they were not. You can see here a seizure response across the multiple doses of glucosamide, and a difference if the individuals were on a combination of glucosamide with a traditional sodium channel drug or not. And the response rates were much higher when the individuals were com on a combination that did not include a traditional sodium channel drug. And response rates were in the 60s and 70s percent, depending upon the dose, which is much higher than the overall response rate. The response rates when people were on a combination of leucosamide with a traditional sodium channel drug were what you expected for a typical anti-seizure drug trial. The response rates were much higher when not in combination with that traditional sodium channel drug. Now this is what's called a post hoc analysis, which means to go back to an original data set and do a new analysis to see what you can find. Post hoc analyses have certain limitations because one can do many, many post hoc analyses and eventually find something interesting, and it's a matter of surfing through the data for something that might be a clue. A more reliable way to study this is prospectively, which means to start out with an idea and test that idea. And recently there was a publication looking at this question prospectively. It was done in Spain with a community population. And it, the individuals who were on a combination of glucosamide with a traditional sodium channel drug did not respond with as high level of seizure control as individuals who were not on a traditional sodium channel drug. And the numbers actually lined up very nicely with what was seen in this post hoc analysis. A prospective study in a community-based population, of course, has limitations, similar to the ones that I described for the study looking at lamotrigine with valproate. However, it's still a signal and something that points us in the direction of what might be a more rational polypharmacy. There's another way of looking at synergy or combination, and that is to examine individuals who start off on one drug and get transitioned to another drug. Perhaps similar to what's done in the rat studies with the isobolograms, except it's more toward a clinical outcome. The slide you see before you comes out of a clinical study performed during which individuals were, who were on single drugs, either with phenytoin, carbamazepine, or valparate, were converted to single treatment or monotherapy with lamotrigine. During the transition time, these individuals were in a combination of drugs because, of course, it would not be safe or ethical to stop a medication, wait for the medication to clear, and then start another medication. Because there was a point of transition, there was an opportunity to study this for changes in seizure frequency during the transition. What one sees is that regardless of which medication the individual started on, the response rate with monotherapy lamotrigine was very similar, and this is at the right side of the chart. However, one sees that during the transition, the individuals who were on a combination of lamotrigine with valparate had lower seizure frequency than the individuals who were on a combination of lamotrigine with either phenytoin or carbamazepine. The phenytoin and carbamazepine individuals were very close to each other, not separable statistically. However, those on valparate did have lower frequency of seizures in a clinically or statistically significant um, extent. And then as they came off of the valparate, their seizure frequency went up and came, became the same as the other two groups. This is clinical evidence of some evidence of synergy, and at least a difference between the combination of lamotrigine with valparate to the combination of lamotrigine with either carbamazepine or phenytoin. Of course, it's post hoc and has limitations because of that. So the question is, we know that polytherapy can have differences in efficacy 
across different polytherapy regimens, even if polytherapy as a whole does not differ substantially from monotherapy in efficacy. And the question is, which polypharmacy treatments are more efficacious? Well, we want to know whether there's a difference that is additive or whether it's synergistic. And ideally, we'd want a treatment that includes more than one medication that has synergy, where one plus one is not equal to two, that one plus one gives us something more than just the two individual drugs in combination, and does this without increasing the side effects. If we had such a regimen, and this is the more provocative statement, then if we had a combination of medications that we knew had substantially improved efficacy when in combination, would we want to use these medications earlier? We know about half of individuals who are treated with epilepsy respond to the first medication tried. And as you increase over successive monotherapy trials, the response rates increase to maybe 70 percent. Hypothetically, if we, if we had a combination of two drugs that had response rates of 80 or 90 percent when using combination, there could be an argument, at least, whether to start with that combination. Of course, using a combination of drugs carries a burden, not just of adverse effects. There's also one of safety uh, in that each medication a patient, patient takes, or any of us takes, regardless of the condition being treated, carries the risk of some idiosyncratic reaction, toxicity, uh, allergic reaction. And as we combine medications, the likelihood of hitting one drug through bad luck causing allergic reaction goes up. So that has to be included in this consideration of uh, going to a polytherapy earlier on. Polytherapy also, of course, has increased cost in that now two medications are being used when one might suffice. But balancing this should be the issue of the cost of seizures, that the cost of loss of work time and cost of more doctor's visits, the cost of ER visits and ambulances should be considered as well. And then, of course, polytherapy can be more complicated, that the challenges to staying on a regimen when it includes two medications can lead to a problem with adherence or remembering which medication is taken when, which can lead to a problem as well. I'm putting this out there for, for consideration as we go forward, and all this is based upon the idea, the dream, that we will reach a point where we'll identify a combination of medications that has clinically significant, more than even statistically significant, but clinically significant improvement in response. It seems that with each medication that's come to market, the response rates for that one medication is very similar to all the prior medications. And that, of course, it can be the miracle drug that's in the pipeline now or just over the horizon that might be different. But while we wait for that compound to be synthesized or that medication to come to market, the challenge before us, the exciting challenge, is to think about ways to study and test combinations to use what we have at hand already to improve treatment. So how do we get to that? Well, we can start with preclinical data. We can start with the animal models and do the isobotographic studies I described. And perhaps we can find ways to better predict through these studies which medication combinations may be superior. We can then take the clinical data we already have from the very, very well organized prospective studies and analyze the data looking for clues or signals of which combinations may be best. And these Experiments using data sets are exploratory, but they can provide a way of looking in prospective studies and save time and not do prospective studies that are less likely to generate something meaningful. When we do these large studies, it's important to have a population of participants, of patients, who are more or less homogeneous in their condition, so we can better predict how it's going to work for the patients in our practices. But it's also important to have a group of investigators or clinicians who are homogeneous in that we're not going to be missing something because of differences in practice style. Having homogeneous approaches is established as part of well-organized prospective clinical studies. But post hoc analyses, of course, introduce questions of whether the differences we see are really differences in patient populations, geographic differences that may be reflected in both the patients and the clinicians. Ultimately, it's going to be pr through prospective, randomized trials that we find which combinations are best. And these studies have to be balanced and independent, but they also have to focus in on the combinations of drugs that are most likely to have benefit. One way to do this efficiently is perhaps to use what are called historic controls, looking at seizure rates going back in time to save money and effort and money to answer these questions more efficiently. Thank you.